In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. I greet you, brothers and sisters, this morning in the middle of our Pascha season. It's called Mid-Pentecost. I want to speak to you briefly because we want to have Vechnaya Pamiat for our departed and beloved hierarch after this word. And we also have our little micro Moleben, that's what I call it, and I, with respect, for the suffering in this world, war-torn places especially. But for us, the divine conversation. The first divine conversation in scripture is Genesis, where God is actually in dialogue with himself, which through the Christian revelation we realize it's actually the Holy Trinity, which is in an internal dialogue, and then comes the creation of the world, the creation of angels, the creation of matter, dark matter, visible matter. It all happens. And that's the first great conversation. And this is why the church has established in Pascha time the, the fourth gospel, that of John, would be preeminent. In earlier times in the year, different Gospels have center stage, Luke being one of them. But the church deliberately at this time, with some thought, with reflection, decided to make sure that these Gospels of John were set before us. A quick review, if you don't mind. In historical order, what happens first? John tells us about the women first encountering our Lord in the resurrection. Don't touch. Second, he gives us the story of Thomas, where there is a massive amount of touch and a conversion. And then last week, going against nature, defying nature, and bringing about a healing a miracle, because miracles are, in fact, a disobedience against nature, if we could put it that way. Why? Because in these Gospels, we see Jesus actually breaking the law of his time and even bringing other people into it as well. They're coming into, if you will, a sacred breaking. And that's a conversation also. It's a conversation between old law, new law. And so it's appropriate that our Lord would be found actually superseding, breaking, if you will, the very law under which he was born, under which he came, under which he shed his blood. And then today, another divine conversation opens up, but it's predicated on a very human need, thirst. Our Lord thirsts. The woman at the well She's coming for water, too. We can rightly presume she's thirsty also. And then comes the divine conversation opens up. Many times we focus on her marital status. Sometimes we focus on the fact that Jesus is speaking to someone, again, breaking a rule, with whom he should have no conversations whatsoever. And yet in this breaking, in this thirst, and also she's breaking a rule, too, she's inexplicably alone in a time when men and women do not go anywhere alone. Men travel with men, women travel with women, men travel with men, women travel with women, as is still the custom throughout many parts of this world today. It explains why Jesus got lost. If you've ever wondered, how did his parents lose Jesus and they found him in the temple? Have you ever thought about this? And that's a conversation it's likely, the church fathers tell us, is that Jesus was traveling with the male party. And his mother rightly thought he was with that party. And when he wasn't with that party, his male relatives rightly thought, because of his age, he's actually traveling with the female party, which is perfectly allowable. They got home and realized he was with neither party. And some parents here have had this happen, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then a fight breaks out. How could you have done that, honey? What did you do? And then 
God willing, and God be praised, you find the child, sometimes in the backyard, carefully hiding from both, and protracting their playtime as they protract their playtime at night when you tell them to go to bed and they don't go to sleep. They figure out a way to work out some play when you're not supposed to know that. But then you find them. And the divine conversation turns to joy. And so what happens in this conversation now, and why can we call it divine? Because she changes. She changes. The interest in physical water drops, and the interest in life-giving, spiritual nourishment rises up. The Gospel of John, you know, is the Gospel that gives us, in clearest detail, the Holy Eucharist. It's John 6 where we learn that Jesus lost the most disciples of his entire three-year career over one issue, over what is the Eucharist. When he says, I am the bread of life, people dropped him just like that that day. It's John who gives us this because they break away from the divine conversation. A second mark of the divine conversation is this that you will not keep it secret. Just as God's creative power goes into the world, and we have what we call the material world and the spiritual world, it cannot be kept a secret. The amount of light alone is so tremendous. The magnitude of the visible universe is of a number that it's difficult for us to even grasp it. And we're capable of grasping infinity. God's conversation is never a secret. Once it's displayed, it's displayed for all time and for everyone. The mystery of the divine conversation, when it it becomes personal for us, personal, it takes on a tender element. Not only do we convert, we know we've converted, and we can't keep it a secret. We share it. Anyone who has gone through recovery is eager to tell everyone about the joy of recovery. Think about it. You can't contain your joy. Anyone who's lost something precious immediately tells the story of how it was lost and how it was found, such as that child that I mentioned that got away from you. That becomes a family story about how that little one was very wily and got away from us at one time. But inside of it is a joy. And so it comes with our Lord that he would impart this conversation to an outsider, and she becomes an insider. She experiences conversion, and then she shares it. And that's what you're doing. You're in the experience stage of communion with our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, and now in your own way, quietly, if it's so, Or maybe not so quietly, if that's appropriate. You're going to share it. Because it's given to you for the life of the world. You're the first step in that. And that's why the church selects John for Pascha. That we would connect ourselves with the Word. Because he connects Jesus, our Lord and Savior, with the eternal Word, which he is, the Logos. In the beginning was the Word. And God so loved the world that he would take on flesh for our sake. And that is also the Pascha message. We sang at Christmas time just to remind. What did we sing? What's the great hymn of Christmas time? I'm waiting for the choir to supply that. Since the choir recently, our friends who are watching, they recently went to a summit. And they become very, very good. I trust you could hear that. We hear it here. What is it about God is with us, surpassing understanding? And so then you have the incarnation. The divine conversation now becomes physical. God surpassing all understanding. The word of God, the cross, death. And then God surpassing all understanding. The word of God, flesh, death, risen from the dead. And then now, this morning, the Word of God made present through the mysteries of the Eucharist so that men and women and children might live 
forever, that we might not thirst in this life because we'll never thirst in the next life. One last thing on the divine conversation. It has to be nourished. Like any good conversation, it has to have two parties. There has to be discourse. It is not a one-way conversation. It's not a lecture. It's not a sermon. It's not an argument. It's not a rant. It's actually a true intercommunion of souls. Your soul, my soul, at this very moment. God's divinity and essence and his operations with our human created nature and operations. That's what it's all coming down to at this very moment. So give thanks, please. Give thanks to the wisdom of the church that they would arrange at mid Pascha that we would see a lot of John so that we could be taken up in this conversation. And give thanks to our Lord because he's brought us the words of everlasting life, the water that never runs dry. Christ is risen. Truly. Mankind always now.